recording in fact. <laughs> okay, so letting you know it's being recorded. And then I did just want to briefly introduce Dan. So Dan has lived and worked in Montana since the early 2000s. He received a BA in wildlife biology from the University of Montana, also my alma mater, and a master's degree in the fish and wildlife management from the Montana State University. Oh, you, you went to both schools. <laughs> it's a little conflicting sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, hold on, I lost my page. Um, so over his career, he's had the opportunity to work on a wide variety of taxa from the charismatic megafauna like elk and grizzly bears to the charismatic microfauna such as bats and terrestrial small mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and other non-game species. His previous work included establishing baseline surveys for non-game species across northern Rocky Mountains and Great Plains exploring how invasive bromes impact small mammals in sagebrush steppe habitats, modeling disease ecology of large mammals in the GYE and other projects. Um, he is currently the senior zoologist for the Montana Natural Heritage Program where his work focuses on understanding the distribution and conservation status of animal species found in Montana. So he's here to speak with us tonight about small mammals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So welcome, Dan, and yeah. I will let you take it from here. Here we go. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. Um, I am really excited to talk about small mammals. It's not something I get to do a lot. And quite frankly, it's not something that I think a lot of folks are interested in. But, you know, these are animals that form the basis of our ecosystem. They do things like disperse seeds, move the spores of fungi around. Um, they certainly provide prey for all sorts of uh, larger critters. So um, they're really important. I think they're really cool, but um, there's not a whole lot known about them. We're still redefining ranges for some species. And I'll talk about one that actually is in the GYE, but at least up in Montana, we didn't figure that out actually till earlier this year. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of my spiel and hopefully everybody's excited. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen and dive right in. All right, can we uh, can we see that? Get a thumbs up? Okay, cool. So um, as Hillary said, I am the senior zoologist here at the Montana Natural Heritage Program. Kind of our bread and butter at heritage programs um, is really collecting data on um, animal species, archiving that data and distributing that um, out to help wildlife managers make good decisions to researchers to help understand species. And then also to the general public who are just interested in these species. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how to identify animals and what animals are where. So this really does um, dovetail uh, nicely with my, uh, with my current work. And um, just to kind of start thinking, you know, this is a, uh, a uh, conversation or a presentation about identification of, of mammal species. And I think um, before I go too far, I just I thought it might be of interest to run through kind of my philosophy on how to identify things um, and maybe why we want to do it. So, you know, first and foremost, identification of animals is hard. You know, there's, there's folks who spend their entire career thinking about the minutia, maybe that's the genetics or different morphological attributes, you know, the attributes of skeletons of um, fur coloration that separate one species for another. And sometimes it's often difficult to actually identify an animal that you see in the field. Um, many animals are only identifiable, particularly in this group, um, via characteristics um, of their skulls, such as the patterns of tooth, teeth, the number of teeth. Um, others are really only identified by genetics. They might have some subtle variations from other similar species, but um, without a genetic test, you know, it's difficult to actually prove that there is a difference. So um, kind of taken like this, if you're out for a hike and, or, you know, in your yard and you see an animal and you catch a, you know, brief glimpse of it, it can oftentimes be difficult to say that it was anything more than, you know, a mammal or maybe, you know, a shrew or something like that. So I think it's oftentimes a good approach to think about identifying to the most exact taxonomic level possible without being wrong. Um, for instance, um, if you um, think it's a, a shrew, but you're not sure, you might just want to say that, well, yeah, it's a mammal. Um, and then you'd be right. 
you wouldn't be uh, assigning a, a species ID to something that could possibly be another species. Um, additionally, collecting evidence is always great. You know, we have the wonderful smartphones now that we can take pictures of things and take lots of photos. So if you can, um, also detailed lists of attributes, particularly for rare or hard to identify species for why you made that ID are also a good idea. And both of those really allow, you know, kind of the scientific method to take place because you can show those to somebody else and they can say, yeah, I agree with that. Or, you know, maybe I wouldn't be as confident in that idea as possible. Um, I think it's good to remain an objective observer. Um, again, you know, this is hard and sometimes you really want to see animals. I know I do this with birds all the time. I go to a place and I really want to see one particular species. So all of a sudden everything starts looking like that species. Um, so just keeping that in mind. Um, and finally, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I miss ID animals all the time. So I think it's really important to be open to um, constructive criticism and debate um, when getting to that final species level ID. And finally, this dovetails really nicely with what, you know, you guys do, as well as um, what I do, is record your observation. You know, these data are valuable. And if they just sit in a notebook or in your head, you know, they're not getting out in the world, they don't have legs, and they're not contributing toward the knowledge and conservation of these species. So um, there's a number of resources um, that folks can, uh, can look at if they want to learn more or more detail about any of these species. All three states that overlap the greater Yellowstone ecosystem have online field guides. Wyoming's focuses more on rare species. They don't have all the species there, but they have really good accounts for the species they do. Our field guide has a lot of species in there. Some of our accounts are great. Some of them are still a work in progress, but we have decent species lists and oftentimes you can see range maps and a lot of other cool details. Idaho has a really well-developed species catalog as well. And the links are here and I can certainly send those or drop out afterward or drop those in the chat. Additionally, iNaturalist, um, which is a community science-based application is I'm finding really handy for ID. Um, it's a community of folks that can weigh in on different IDs of various photographs um, or other evidence, such as uh, calls or other recorded audio. And um, it's really helpful, particularly if you're not familiar with the group. I've found out a lot about um, spiders and other invertebrates um, through using that resource. And finally, there's a number of field guides. Um, I'm going to be, you know, show my bias here. You know, being from Montana, I really like uh, Carrie Forsman's guide mammals of Montana, but there are certainly guides that cover Idaho and Wyoming as well, and that are equally, if not better. So, you know, how would you expect to see small mammals? Um, small mammals aren't birds, you know, they're not flashy, they don't run around. Um, maybe with the exception of ground squirrels, they're, you know, not particularly observable. So, um, you know, from a research perspective, um, you know, I typically trap small mammals if I'm interested in what the community or diversity is in an area that's using both live and kill traps. Unfortunately, a number of animals within this group are only identifiable via their dental characteristics and sometimes also by skull attributes. So you need a clean skull and you need to put it under a microscope or a dissecting scope and take a look at it. And that's really the only way that we can be confident in our species ID. So that does necessitate the use of um, snap traps and other lethal traps, but mostly we try to use live traps, um, you know, have a hard traps or Sherman traps or something similar to that. For bats, um, you know, they're often up in the air. Um, so we do things like use acoustic detector recorders, which can record their echolocation calls and take those back and look at them on a computer and make a species ID from that. We set mist nets over water or in flyways while they're flying around at night, foraging, drinking, commuting between places, they get caught. You can pull them out, take a good look at them, try to get what species there are and about how many we're catching. Um, we also do roost searches, you know, that's wandering through rock outcrops with a flashlight, looking for bats roosting in cracks and crevices within cliff bands and talus slopes, um, but also looking in buildings um, and other, you know, sometimes trees, but we haven't had a had good success figuring out a protocol with that. But for members of the general public, you guys included, um, you know, most often I think you're going to encounter these through direct observation. You know, that's going for a hike and seeing an animal across the trail, um, you know, sitting down somewhere. Sometimes they'll, you know, start foraging or doing other stuff near you. And that's a great 
opportunity to, to see these animals and kind of see what they're up to. Um, additionally, trail cams um, can get some great photos. I think almost every single species here is observable with a, you know, a remote camera. So I know I've had a lot of fun trying to put these out. And, you know, I think it's an interesting thing that other folks can utilize too. They do make some uh, bat detectors. These are um, particularly wildlife acoustics, makes something called an echometer touch, which plugs into an iPhone and will show you the echolocation calls and provide a tentative ID. It's right sometimes, wrong sometimes, but it's a pretty cool thing. And then, you know, oftentimes I find a lot of dead animals just on the ground. They die of natural causes. It's a great way to get an animal in hand, take a closer look at it. And finally, owl pellets are a great source of information about local small mammals. Um, there's a really cool paper out of southern Canada where they were actually able to not only um, look at the diversity of small mammals based on the skulls that they were finding in owl pellets, but also look at how the animals were um, structured via soil type. They found, you know, with a given soil, some species were more common. So, you know, great source of information. So within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, there's um, a little over, let's see, what would that be? Almost 50 species of small mammals. And I should say that um, I'm definitely biased toward Montana and the northern um, GYE. I'm, there are a number of species that exist further south, and I'm not sure how close they come, you know, to some of the areas um, kind of at the real southern part of that range. I'm not an expert in those areas, so I figured I'd just stick with what I know. So. You know, when I'm talking about the GYE for the rest of this talk, it's going to be everything in that red circle or approximately there. Within this area, we have about eight species of shrews, 14 species of bats, which is notable because this is almost all the species of bats that you'd expect to find in Montana and northern Wyoming. So it's incredibly diverse um, in this area, as well as 27 species of rodents. Um, just to keep on time for this talk, so we have questions I did not um, include rabbits, you know, so those are, um, you know, cotton-tailed rabbits, jacked rabbits, and pika, but they do exist here, and um, I think they probably would fall under that um, definition of small mammal as well. So to start out with shrews, um, these are, I think, one of the coolest small mammals that no one really knows about. Um, they're ubiquitous. They're very common in all ecosystems. Um, but they're rarely seen. And this is actually surprising because they're active um, almost all day and night. They have an incredibly high metabolism and they need to eat um, very regularly, sometimes as often as every hour, although they will cache food when they find it. Um, you know, such that um, occasionally if we do catch them in pitfall traps and don't check the traps for overnight, they'll actually starve to death in the pitfall traps. So you know, these guys are taking in a lot of calories, they're living really fast, and that means that they're out foraging a lot. So if you're in an area where you know they are and you just sit still, oftentimes you can find them. Um, they're active year round, they don't hibernate, so they rely on the subnivian space, um, that's the space between the snow and the ground, to forage for overwintering arthropods, you know, various bugs that are kind of just hanging out for the winter waiting for spring. So that makes up a majority of their diet. And some species will actually shrink their brain matter, the total volume of that tissue, because it's so energy intensive to maintain it during the winter. Um, so it's pretty unique. And um, another kind of cool fact about them, a number of species have actually been shown to echolocate, not as well developed as bats, but they can definitely find their way around in the absence of light and can echolocate well enough to avoid going off edges. Um, the classic experiment is putting a shrew on a pedestal in a dark room and they won't fall off the edge of that pedestal. They'll just kind of circle it and do what they do. Um, in terms of identifying these, I think they're probably most easily confused with um, mice um, or other rodents. You know, they have the same kind of body shape, you know, small four-legged critter with a long tail and a sharp snout. But if you look at the shrew, they actually have a relatively long pointed snout here. And if you look at the skull, that, um, you know, it's not as um, kind of short and blunt as most rodents. And they have a number of um, teeth that are relatively undifferentiated, excuse me, more similar to, you know, kind of the prehistoric or basal mammal species that you'd expect to have very similar looking teeth. Um, they also lack true incisors, which would be a good way if you can see the teeth to separate them from rodents. Um, and, I think the easiest way to kind of get 
identification for them down is just, you know, if you look at them enough, you get this general kind of gestalt or, you know, sense of what they look like, and then they become pretty easy to separate from, say, deer mice or some of our other common rodents. Um, that being said, I think they're easy to separate from rodents, but identifying animals within this group is incredibly difficult. Um, all of the shrews within this are within the same genus, the genus Sorex, um, that's long-tailed shrews. And oftentimes identification requires detailed examination of not only the number of teeth, but also their shape, the staining of the teeth. Um, as you can see in this um, photo of a skull over here, they get this pigmentation on their teeth, that red stuff. So some species require detailed examination of how far up the staining goes on the teeth. And some even require um, examination of the foramen position. So foramen are just holes in skulls um, where nerves or um, you know, blood vessels pass through. You can see right by between the P and the M kind of above there, there are two foramen there. Um, specifically to separate uh, mask shrew from, I believe it's Hayden shrew, you have to look at the relative position of those two foramen to the middle molar. So needless to say, that's beyond the scope of what I'm gonna talk about today. And I won't bore everybody with uh, detailed shots through a dissecting scope, but um, I just wanted to throw that out there to, to help, help everybody kind of understand that um, these really aren't species that you're gonna be regularly identifying. Most Shrews I see go to Sorex, um, Sorex species. If you are interested, uh, there's a good key, um, again, written by Carrie Forsman that does get into detail like this. So if you do find a shrew and can clean the skull, you can certainly tackle this on your own. But I would advocate if you do have a good specimen that um, you look into submitting that to a zoological museum. We don't know a whole lot about this group and the more specimens we get, the more you know, a chance that you might pick up species we didn't know was there, or at least increase the density and quality of the data on there. All that being said, we do have one species that is identifiable, um, and that's the western water shrew, which has a really cool life history. These are animals that live in or alongside streams and, you know, small bodies of water within our area. For a shrew, they're relatively large, and by large, I mean they might be the size of your thumb. Um, certainly bigger than the other ones, but by no means actually big. They have this distinct bicolored pelage. Um, and when I say pelage, I'll use that frequently. That just means the fur. So dark on top, light on bottom, high contrast. Um, that's not a diagnostic characteristic, but it helps you get there. What you can really use to identify them are these cool hairs that they have on their legs. So shrews aren't, don't have webbed feet, but they have these hairs that lay down on their toes so when they're running around on the ground, they're not an impediment, but when they hop in the water and start foraging for aquatic insects and they push, those hairs flare out and act like a uh, like webbing. So they're the only species of shrew we have here that has that. Um, they're also the only species of shrew that you'll find foraging in water. So I've seen these um, sitting on a stream, you know, taking a break and you'll watch them. They'll come out, they'll jump in the water, swim around, grab something to eat, go hide that in the bank, and then a few minutes later they'll go do it again. So if you see a small animal jumping in the water, swimming around and foraging, chances are it's a shrew. If you see a larger small mammal, it's probably a water bull. We'll talk about those here in a minute. But first I'd like to go through bats. So bats are also an incredibly common species. Um, you know, they're everywhere. If you walk around with a, uh, an acoustic bat detector, you will find bats foraging or traveling through almost every single place, anywhere within Montana, within Wyoming, within Idaho. It's incredible. We actually know our detectors malfunction when they don't record individuals. We've had very few that have sat out for any amount of time that didn't pick up at least one bat. However, they're also, I think, among our most threatened group of um, animals within the state. It's the only group that I think we might actually see extinctions within probably the next 20 to 50 years, um, if not sooner. Um, some of our bats are facing um, pretty significant threats from wind energy development, particularly our tree roosting bat species are actually attracted to wind turbines in the fall. We think it has something to do with how they breed and they like to swarm around really large trees. So, you know, a big wind turbine out in the middle of uh, the plains is like the, uh, the ultimate tree that attracts them. Truth is, we don't know why they do, but when they go close to the turbines, it doesn't really end well for them. Um, I think the biggest threat to uh, declining um, bat populations, however, is a fungal disease known as white nose syndrome. 
I think by this point, most folks have heard of it, but this is a disease that's causing, you know, close to 90 to 99% declines of some species in the eastern U.S. And right now it's, uh, I think, gotten all the way through Wyoming, about two thirds of Montana, and was just recently detected in eastern Idaho last year. So it's here within a few years, we should start seeing significant declines. And I figured um, since we're talking about bats, bats are cool. Um, bats are also a rabies vector. Not that many of them are actually rabid, um, contrary to popular belief, but still, please don't pick them up. We're going to talk about ID, but you know, as a biologist, I'm vaccinated for rabies. I get tested regularly to make sure my va rabies vaccinations are working. So that makes me comfortable to handle them, but we just rec strongly recommend that um, folks who don't actually need to work or need to handle don't. Um, just for your own safety. So just a general disclaimer. Within the GYE, we have 14 species. That's relatively high diversity for how far north we are. Um, I think that like shrews, bats can be among some of the most challenging mammals to identify. Um, oftentimes, particularly for our myotis bats, we're talking about differences of you know one to two millimeters in the ears separating species. Um, whether or not they have a, a projection of cartilage off their heel, um, you know, very nuanced um, things. And a lot of times the actual coloration of species is highly variable, which just confounds, confounds the identification thing. However, we do have a number of species that are also really cool that you can readily identify if you can get a clear look at them. Um, Unfortunately, it's really difficult to identify them while they're flying. I don't think I've ever had an identification of a flying bat that I was comfortable actually recording um, for myself. Um, so first species is probably one, if you have seen bats, this would be um, one of the ones that you would have most likely seen. It's one of our most common bats, and it's also often found in association with buildings and other um, anthropogenic roosts. So people run into them quite a bit. And that is the big brown bat. It's also one of our larger species as the uh, common name would suggest. It's also brown, so very well named. Um, oftentimes find these guys roosting in barns, in attics. Um, they also like rock outcrops, um, which is I think an underappreciated um, you know, source of roost habitat for a number of bat species. They also will roost in trees, um, primarily under bark and cracks and crevices. And they hibernate um, in caves and mines, rock crevices, and also in undetermined locations. We don't know a lot about where our bats go in the winter, and these guys seem like they can roost almost anywhere. They really, you know, tolerate cold weather. You know, we've got them on acoustic detectors active down to close to zero degrees Fahrenheit, so. They deal really well with our winters up here and you know they honestly could just be um you know in holes in the ground or other kind of um you know maybe non-traditional overlooked roosts another large bat species that we have is the hoary bat that's the um i think one of our if not the largest species in this area um, these guys are a tree roosting species so during the daytime, they find a nice tree, you know, either a deciduous tree um, or a conifer. They'll actually hang in the branch tips and just kind of tuck in and sleep the day away and then wake up at night and forage. Um, it would be really hard to confuse with any other species of bat. They have this, um, as their common name would suggest, hoary pelage, that means frost tipped. They also have these distinctive white patches on their elbows and wrists right here. And they're a migratory species, so you'd likely see them kind of in our neck of the woods starting in about May, right around now. They start showing up and they typically leave in September, although we do have a few records as late as November. Um, we don't know where they go. We think that some maybe go to the Pacific Coast to overwinter. Some other ones go down to um, probably the South Central or Southeastern US. Um, and Interestingly enough, too, they uh, show this uh, sexual selection for different parts of the continent. In the Western US, it's almost always males. Um, and if you go further east, right on the Montana Dakota border, you start catching mostly females. And then if you go further east, it's almost all females. So they kind of split up during the active season and then reconvene later in the year. Um, 
This striking species of bat is called the spotted bat. It's also a very large bat, one of the most rare mammals across the entire North American continent. Um, and it's not because we're missing them. They're very identifiable. Not only do they have really striking pelage, um, you know, this black and white pattern is unique within bats. They have these giant ears, um, but we can also hear them. They're the only bat species that actually echolocates within the range of human hearing down at about eight kilohertz. So if you're out and about and you hear a bat echolocating, that's not making social calls. A number of our other bat species kind of squabble at each other and you can hear it if you're listening for it. But if you're ever walking around, um, particularly over by Cody or kind of over toward the prior mountains and you hear like a clicking, really deep kind of sharp sound, that's a spotted bat. That's really cool. And you should tell somebody that you heard one because we don't know a lot about them. We think these guys roost uh, primarily in cliffs and rock outcrops. We used to think big cliffs, but we continually get them near smaller, um, particularly sandstone outcrops seem to be good habitat for them. We don't know if they migrate or if they stick around for the winter. We just stop seeing them in about October. But they certainly can fly and potentially could fly you know, further south. They often will travel over 60 kilometers one direction to forage in an evening. So considering the bat is a little bit bigger than the size of my thumb, that's pretty incredible. Another big eared species that we have is the Townsend's big eared bat. They're a, uh, a bat that um, preferentially roosts in caves and mines, characterized by long ears, kind of dull pelage color, and also these lumps on their nose. So if you've ever been to Lewis and Clark Caverns in Montana, they have a, a uh, maternity colony in the uh, entry room. So it's a great place to see them. Silverhead bats are another bat species similar to the hoary bat that has a uh, frosted appearance or frosted pelage. Um, this is more prominent in younger individuals and fades with age. I think they look a lot like our myotis bats and occasionally get that wrong. But the one field mark I look for that is easiest to, excuse me, find would be this uh, white leading edge of the ear here. They're the only bat species in our area that has that. And once you kind of know what to look for, it makes it really easy to identify them. These guys roost primarily in trees, um, oftentimes in uh, holes in the trunk or on the trunk directly. They also will use human structures. And they have a really interesting overwintering strategy. We get calls from silverheads on our detectors year round. So we know some stay in the state. BC, um, they've documented them overwintering rock outcrops. But there's also evidence that at least some of them go over to the Pacific coast and overwinter over there. They find bats that have a, uh, a molecular signature in the winter over there that coincides with our area. So some of them are migrating, some of them stay. We don't really know much more than that, but it's, it's really interesting. And finally, we have a group of seven bats, which all look very similar to each other and are really difficult to differentiate. So I'm just going to lump them in here. Um, I think it's entirely appropriate to just call these guys myota species and leave it at that. But within the greater Yellowstone area, we have seven species. We're getting species from further west, like Yuma myotis and California myotis, and then other species, which are more um, restricted to, say, the Rocky Mountains. Um, so it's a really cool um, ecological area because we can get almost every single species of bat, at least that's found in Montana, with the exception of um, northern long-eared bat, which is a, a federally endangered species that's found on the Montana-Dakota borders. So they're all um, pretty small. They range anywhere from about four grams to eight grams in weight. Um, the biggest ones have a body size a little smaller than my thumb, smallest one probably has a body size about two thirds of my pinky. Um, they roost in man-made structures, that's buildings, bridges, caves, mines, rock outcroppings, and trees. They are incredibly common um, and really cool animals. Um, but yeah, you really need to get a good look in hand. And then there's even some species like the Yuma myotis and the little round myotis where you often have to take a genetic sample. That's a you know little snip from the wing membrane or um, some guano to, uh, to actually figure out what species it is and how to lab run that. So finally, um, this is the biggest group. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this, but um, yeah, talk about rodents here. So these are the most abundant and diverse group of, of mammals in our area. There are more rodents than there are 
um, pretty much any other species within the, the GYE. Um, they're a group that are characterized by ever-growing incisor teeth for gnawing. If you look at the upper right here, there's a beaver skull. You can see those incisors that are stained up front. They're also characterized by a diastema, which is a spacing between the incisors and the molars. Um, there's another group that have similar attributes. That's the logomorphs, so our hares, um, rabbits, and pikas. You can see uh, one of the skulls, I think, for um, a uh, black-tailed jackrabbit down in the bottom right. The way that we can separate, um, at least at a, if you know, if we're looking at skulls, um, rabbits from from rodents would be looking for this fenestration of the rostrum or the maxilla, excuse me. So that's this honeycomb pattern that's found kind of above the, uh, the upper jaw there. So rabbits have that, um, rodents don't. Also logomorphs have two sets of incisors on their upper jaw. You can see those down. There's one set in front and then a smaller set behind. So rodents don't have that. So if you find a skull and it's, it's fairly common to find um, you know, skulls from like marmots or ground squirrels or prairie dogs that are about the size of rabbit skulls. Those are good ways to tell those apart. So across the, the GYE, or at least um, in the area that I'm more familiar with, um, we have about 27 species. And this is, a, this is a little bit of a rough guess. Again, there are certain species of uh, small mammals that we don't have like the uh, distribution you know, as good as, you know, I'd like it personally. But, you know, the more data we get, the closer we are to, uh, to being confident in that number. So we have a pretty wide diversity, everything from beavers, you know, which the North American beaver is one of the largest rodents in North America, all the way down to, um, you know, some of our smaller mice and voles and other things, as well as some pretty unique species. So beavers should be a species that I'm sure everybody is familiar with and would be um, pretty difficult to confuse with anything else. Um, you know, sometimes if you're looking at pictures, muskrats can be a little challenging in the right, you know, if it's a bad picture, but generally these guys are, um, are difficult to, uh, to mistake. So they get big. You know, again, they're one of our largest rodent species. Um, I think they are the largest rodent species in North America. They have this broad, flat tail, which no other species has. And they oftentimes leave um, pretty good evidence that they're around. They do things like build lodges to overwinter in, as well as dams to create um, ponds, which they then use to uh, you know, provide shelter from predators, to drag branches and stuff down underwater to store for you know, the winter so they can forage on that. Um, so yeah, if you see gnawing, if you see dam construction, if you see piles of sticks in the water, um, chances are there, are there are beavers around. A uh, fairly unique group of um, mice that some folks might be familiar with, um, they are fairly common in the right habitats, are jumping mice. So that's animals in the, uh, I'm trying to remember, Zipotidae. Um, so these guys are characterized by having really large hind feet and really long tails. And as their name would suggest, you know, they jump really well. So the kind of classic jumping mouse encounter, at least from my experience, are walking along, say, a stream in the subalpine or, you know, kind of a, a meadow, you know, interspersed, you know, with like dug fur or something like that and having a little mammal kind of shoot out from your feet and hop and then maybe hop again. Um, these guys, they use their ability to jump. Um, that's those hind feet and their tail. That tail allows them to steer in the air to avoid predators. Um, so they're not shy about it. And if you kind of keep your eyes open, you'll, you'll likely run into them. So we do have two species within our area. <laughs> the Western jumping mouse, which is by far the most common species. Um, and you can see up in the upper right, they have this long tail. And in the case of Western jumping mice, the tail's not distinctly bicolored. It might have a little bit of color on it, but mostly it's just one color and it's scaly. And recently, um, based on an iNaturalist observation, our program was able to extend the uh, range of meadow jumping mice, which is, we thought they were distributed a lot further east, all the way over to the Red Lodge area. 
this is a species that lives in really dense um, riparian um, vegetation. So, you know, say tall grass along along a small stream. And they're found kind of over by Red Lodge in the Beartooth foothills. You know, in my mind, there's no reason that they can't be further over, at least the still water drainage and possibly even further, you know, kind of up over maybe toward Livingston. So certainly a species that, well, they might be very characteristic, easy to identify, even easy to see, and just hasn't really seen um, a whole lot of research interest. So, you know, we don't know a whole lot about them, although I would love to have the opportunity to learn more. We have a couple non-native um, rodent species that are present in this area. Those would be um, mice and rats and the, uh, the muridae, um, particularly the house mouse and the brown rat. See, there's, these are species that are native to Europe and Asia. Um, they're often associated with human habitation. Um, so, you know, I get house mice in my house up here in Helena. Um, I'm sure most urban areas have established populations of these guys, as well as, you know, rats don't seem to do quite as well up here, but we do get reports of them, you know, from the Bozeman area and some of the other towns um, adjacent to, uh, to Yellowstone. So to separate these guys from our native animals, they both have these scaly tails that lack like any distinct coloration, sort of similar to those uh, jumping mice, but these guys have tails that are maybe a little longer than their body length instead of, you know, over two times body length. Um, to separate these guys from each other, um, you know, house mice are gonna be as small, if not smaller than immature um, brown rats. So it's really just a, a question of, size as well as just kind of a general gestalt um, looking at you know kind of you know something you could get at by just comparing pictures um, and you'd be very unlikely to find these guys um, in more natural habitats i think the only time i've ever caught a house mouse anywhere that wasn't in someone's yard was in an old abandoned farmstead that you know hadn't been occupied in like 30 or 40 years but still had a small population of house mice persisting near it so We do have a number of native mouse species within this area. Um, a lot of these are classified in the Cryptidae, that's our New World mice and voles. The most ubiquitous species probably that I'll cover today, um, certainly within any of these three states, is the North American deer mouse. Um, that's Paramiscus maniculatus. Um, however, it was recently split by some authorities into western deer mice and eastern deer mice. So you might start seeing um, the species called Western deer mouse, and that would be um, described as P. sorinensis. So it recently has happened. We're still in the process of deciding whether that's something that we want to go with, or maybe we need to wait and see how that kind of shakes out while the, the mouse experts uh, kind of hash it out in the background. Um, this is the most common rodent in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. This is the one that you'll see in your house. Um, you'll see in cabins and, you know, you can find pretty much anywhere. You know, they do really well in burnt forests. They do well in sagebrush. They do well in grasslands if there's rocks and, you know, enough structure to hide in. They also do well in coniferous forests. So they're, uh, they're very, very ubiquitous. They also don't really look like a whole lot, particularly within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. If we get a little further afield, um, there are Another species of Paramiscus mouse, the white-footed mouse, which is found along the Yellowstone River and its tributaries, as well as further north. Um, grasshopper mice are unfortunately not found. You know, they're found close to, but not within the GYE. And those guys look almost identical to um, these deer mice, except that their tails are um, probably about less than 30% of their body length. They almost look like a, a deer mouse that somebody whacked the tail off of. So those are a very cool species. I'd encourage everybody to, to look into them a little bit further, but I don't really have time to, to go into exactly why they are. Um, another species that falls in this group is the bushy-tailed wood rat. Um, I think this is another common one that most folks are familiar with. You might be more familiar with them as pack rats or um, I think one of the coolest common names that I've seen is trade rat, and that's because they like to uh, pick up shiny objects and sometimes they'll drop whatever they're carrying. So you might leave like a spoon out and, you know, you might get a piece of animal bone or something um, the next morning. 
So they're common in buildings, rocky areas, anywhere that they have structure that they can build nests, um, also caves. They have this kind of large size, these Mickey Mouse ears and a bushy, you know, as the common name would suggest, a bushy tail. They also produce this stuff called amberat. If you spend enough time around cliffs, um, you'll see this kind of black stuff smeared. It's not bat guano. That's a common misconception. It's these guys over generations marking their territory. So using um, urinating and defecating in the same spot. And this forms this kind of hardened stuff. So if you see that, that's where it came from. They also produce middens too, which are pretty characteristic. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen voles. Um, voles are another group that um, are very difficult to identify. They have very subtle variations in pelage, so coloration, although tail length can be diagnostic. We have a number of species of microtus um, voles, so that's in the genus microtus. Meadow vole and uh, montane vole are very common. Um, Meadow voles tend to occupy lower elevation sites, montane voles a little bit higher, although that can differ um, depending on the presence of the other species. So they will characteristically exclude each other. To separate between those um, and be confident, you need to actually look at their teeth. And in particular, you need to go look at one of their back molars and look for a small loop of dentine coming off one of those. So something you could do, but generally we just consider them as kind of a species pair and just call them microtus voles. Long-tailed voles are more, um, readily identifiable. If you can get a clear view of the animal as well as its tail, um, if it's a vole with a tail that's about two thirds of its body length or greater, that's a long tailed vole and you can be pretty confident in that species ID. Finally, we have another vole that looks very similar to these but isn't in that genus, that's the Western Heather Bull. There are, this one's a little bit different. You can almost differentiate it based on the kind of fur color. Um, but there's a lot of variation there. So I'm never confident in that. I like to see teeth. So I'd classify that as one that's just like, it's a bowl. Um, if you're lucky enough to get a skull, maybe you can put it under a scope and figure that out. We do have several other species of voles, which are um, easy to identify. Sagebrush vole, which are common, as the common name would suggest, in sagebrush ecosystems, have these short little stubby tails. So if you see something that's, you know, with a tail that's under 25% of body length, it's a sagebrush bull. They also have this really indistinct um, white ring or kind of almost skin colored ring around their eye. Once you start looking for that, um, that's also really helpful for ID. And finally, we have a bull species that is really easy to identify if you just see them running around. Um, it's the Southern Redback Bull and it has this beautiful red coloration along its back. Um, it has relatively large ears that poke out of the fur in contrast to other myotis bulls. And you'll find these guys in forested areas, it's conifer uplands. They seem to really like um, deciduous forest as well as um, willow shrublands. Um, you know, I've seen them out in the sagebrush just in willow patches along creeks, which is kind of wild. We have a couple species of aquatic uh, mice and voles. I'd, muskrats are almost voles. They're really closely related. So they kind of fall within this group, but um, we have muskrats which again might be mistaken for beavers. They're about a third of the size of a beaver, give or take. Inhabit ponds and creeks and have a really similar life history. Um, to separate them from beavers, you know, if you are, if you say only have a picture of like one of these animals heads or something, you can see that muskrats have this really um, distinct or excuse me, indistinct kind of black mask that beavers don't have. Also their um, fur is almost a little bit spinier and definitely has like a different kind of gestalt to it. And most notably, they do have a narrower tail. It is black and scaly like a beaver, but it's not flattened. A really cool species that we have is the North American water bull or Microtus richardsonii. So it's related to those other Microtus bulls, but it's easier to identify. You know, number one, it's about two times the size of most other bulls. And it, similar to our uh, water shrew, inhabits creeks, um, primarily for the water bowl in the subalpine area, although it is found at lower elevations. So if you're walking along a creek in the subalpine and you start seeing uh, cans that are about the diameter of a Coke can, you know, chances are these guys are in the area. And if you sit still, you can catch them out and actually see them forage and swimming around, which is really neat. All right, so we've got a few more groups left. I'll try to get through those so we have time for questions. Um, 
Another group that most folks should be familiar with are pocket gophers, the Geomyidae. So northern pocket gopher is by far one of the most common mammals that we see around. It's also one of our few fossorial mammals, meaning that they dig underground. Within Idaho, um, Wyoming, and Montana in this area, we don't have moles. So if you see tailing piles um, anywhere, those are um, pocket gopher mounds. We also see these things called eskers. In the winter, pocket gophers tunnel um, in that subnivian space, so above ground, but under the snow. And oftentimes they'll pack dirt in their tunnels. So in the spring when that melts, it leaves these, uh, these tunnels that collapse down. So it's another good way to, to see those guys. Um, so we do have two species. Northern pocket gopher is common. You know, they have these large claws, short tail. Idaho pocket gopher is a pretty rare species. We don't really understand a whole lot about them. They're not commonly captured or reported. Um, you need genetics to differentiate them from northern pocket gophers, although they are slightly smaller in size. And some sources say they have this dark postericular patch kind of behind the ear, but that's also variable. So it might not be that, um, that easy to, or that useful for differentiating these species. As you can see, the northern pocket gopher also has a little bit of dark around the ear too. So you can imagine that that might just be a little difficult to separate with. This one should be very identifiable to everybody here, and I'm sure almost everybody's seen one, but the North American porcupine is uh, another large rodent that we have. This is found not only in our forested areas, but also in shrublands. And one thing that I was really surprised when I started doing work out in eastern Montana is you find these in grasslands a lot of times too, really anywhere that they can you know, build a den um, where they could be safe from predators. I think one of the biggest issues um, for confusing with another um, with another species would be that um, they do have these diagnostic chews. As you can see over here on the right, this is a porcupine chewing on this branch. However, bears chew on trees. They strip bark for cambium. Um, even trees sometimes just shedding, like dead trees shedding bark can all kind of look like this. So I feel very confident in identifications of animals or you know pieces of porcupine. I'm usually pretty skeptical when people say they've seen porcupine chews. Um, it's nice to have pictures for that. And finally, we're gonna leave with uh, some of the most frustrating and kind of cool species that I think we'll talk about. Um, chipmunks are very identifiable. They're very active. Lots of people see them. They like to take pictures of them. They're also almost impossible to separate at a species level. Um, they can be confused with one of our ground squirrel species I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, that's the golden mantled ground squirrel, which has similar striping on the back. These guys are much smaller and they also have striping on their head, which makes separating from ground squirrels pretty easily. Um, it, at the scientific level, what we typically do is look at skeletal morphology. Um, so measuring the skeleton and various bones to separate these. Um, but also if you can get pictures of the color of the chest and the underside of the tail and their habitat and also the behavior, that, you know, sometimes you, you can use all that to work out an ID that, that holds water. I think least chipmunks probably are most identifiable. These guys are really small, um, much smaller, about two thirds the size of some of our other species. And they tend to be pretty gray, although you can see this guy also has some red coloration. This varies. Sometimes they're all gray, sometimes they're pretty colorful, which makes confusion with the others pretty, um, pretty easy to do. Yellow pine chipmunks are also have you know some attributes like a yellow stomach and yellow underside of the tail that work pretty well um, for ID, but it doesn't always. Um, sometimes it can look pretty gray. You went to chipmunks are a little bit larger. Um, this one looks pretty different than our least chipmunk, but I think they have really similar um, coloration. So without kind of relative size, they're difficult to, uh, to identify. And finally, we'll just talk about squirrels. So ground squirrels, we have golden mantle ground squirrel, this guy up top, confused, could be confused with chipmunks, but they have um, lack the striping on the head. Sometimes they're kind of red like this, um, often found in rocky habitats. Um, we do have a several species of Eurocytellus ground squirrels, um, which are very difficult to identify. Um, you went to ground squirrels sometimes have this more gray head with, you know, some spotting, you know, on the backside, which looks pretty similar to the Wyoming ground squirrel, which are typically more muted in color, but there's enough overlap. I just, I, you know, I'm often reluctant to give a species ID. Tree squirrels are a little bit easier. 
you know, we have red squirrels. I'm sure everybody's seen these. These are the ones that chatter. They make middens like up top here and generally just very visible. Um, they're active at, during the day, you know, gathering pine cones and such. Northern flying squirrels are very common, but, you know, they're not necessarily um, that easy to observe. You know, they're strictly nocturnal. You don't really see these guys out in the daytime a whole lot, but they're easy to identify. If you do, they have these membranes um, called petygium membranes on each side that they use to glide as well as this flattened tail. So they'll climb up trees and launch themselves in the air and actually glide between trees. So, and finally, um, we do have one marmot species within this area, which is nice because they can be confused with hoary marmots a little further north. Sometimes the um, coloration overlaps a little bit more than you'd like, but down here, these are the only species that we have. We find them anywhere from valley bottom, you know, in suitable habitat all the way up into the alpine. It's one of our largest rodents. They have a characteristic whistle and they preferentially find rocky habitat, um, or at least habitat that has boulders that they can den under, which serves it to help them, you know, get protection from predators. So we'll just wrap this up here. Um, if you do see any one of these species, um, you know, observations are relative, are pretty valuable. Um, not a lot is known about some species. And again, we certainly don't have all the information we'd like on many of them. So you can report those to your local um, heritage program. I have the, um, the, uh, the links to the various um, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho programs, at least to their submission pages. Um, iNaturalist would be a good place to put this data. And it sounds like um, you guys already have a, uh, another place or another repository for this data, which is awesome. And just to emphasize the impact that um, community science and particularly these incidental type of observations can have. Um, this is that meadow jumping mouse um, observation that I was talking about. So a guy um, who lives outside of Red Lodge found this animal dead in his yard, took a picture, posted it on iNaturalist. I came across it, um, was able to identify it. He confirmed that. We plug that into some of the products that we do. We extended the range map, which is shown here in purple from approximately this red line where it was before all the way out to include this new observation. And then we use that observation and the other observations that we have to actually make a predicted habitat model, which shows areas of suitable habitat as this kind of orange and yellow color. And you can see that by adding in that habitat, we're all getting some areas on the periphery of the animal's range that are lighting up. So those are areas where we can go do further surveys to try and learn a little bit more about the species. So, you know, these, real kind of just offhand data, you know, incidental data can have very meaningful impacts on our understanding of these species, you know, and management of these species as well. That was a lot. <laughs> I'm sure folks have questions. Um, again, this, uh, when I've taught mammalogy lab, this was about, I think a little over a month worth of content distilled down into uh, 45 minutes. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. That was very enjoyable and very um, informative in a number of levels. Um, so the chat was filling up with a bunch of questions and I saw there was kind of a back and forth about this first question that came in, but I'll just allow you to give your answer. It says, do garter snakes eat house mice or voles? Um, you know, I would that's an interesting question. So I've seen garter snakes with shrews in them, done diet studies and my limited experience with that, where you can, you find ones with lumps, you kind of get them to relinquish their meal. Um, I think that they would eat larger prey. I've seen them eat mature um, Western toads, which are certainly smaller than, or excuse me, larger than, you know, some of the mouse species. But I think the mice might be better able to defend themselves than some of the amphibians. So, you know, certainly the mice could be on the menu, but um, I don't know if that's confirmed. So I'd say strong possibility that it's possible, but I don't know if it actually occurs in nature. So awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, Francis is asking, 
what do you what advice do you have that's helpful in separating the vole from the pocket gopher they're a similar shape and a shortish tail so if you just saw an animal and this happened to me this winter i saw one that was running on the snow i assumed it was a pocket gopher but i didn't really know <laughs> Yeah, so um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of those small mammals all have that same form, so it can be pretty difficult. Um, pocket gophers, though, if you look at the um, the front claws, often have almost like a mole-like. Um, you know, their their front feet are are very adapted for digging. Let me see if I can go back to that slide and share that. Um, Oh, the claws. That's right. That's what I used to use when I did the roadkill surveys. Yep. So if we can see, um, did I? We uh, cannot see your screen. Okay. We just Let see your face. This again. There we go. Um, so yeah, if you look in that top one, um, the front claws, you know, are massive, um, highly adapted for digging. So um, yeah, that's that's what I'd use or what I typically use. Um, same thing with the rear claws. Also, the, the ears are actually a little bit more visible than a lot of our bull species, you know, which have this kind of thin, almost like Mickey Mouse ears that hide in the fur. These guys have almost tube-like ears. Again, that's an adaptation for living underground and moving around in tunnels and stuff. So. Um, awesome. That is, that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, and then someone else asked, what is the size difference between voles and pocket gophers, if there is one? Not really. Um, water voles are bigger. Um, I mean, and, and generally, they're, they're around. I, don't, I wouldn't say that there's a meaningful difference, at least enough to be able to um, identify one versus the other. Um, so voles can get a little bit bigger than, say, mice, but pocket gophers are kind of on the larger side of mouse size. So okay really similar another question about voles and this is one i'm sure a lot of us in the room have do voles eat the bark off of snow-covered shrubs yes well i don't know about i know that they do have issues with girdling um, of shrubs i couldn't speak to whether that's a i'd assume it's a winter thing um so i know one interesting thing in my experience um with doing a lot of small mammal related trapping is that um, it can be really difficult to catch voles. You know, they're herbivores. So um, if you're baiting traps with, uh, with like seed, like we normally use, um, they don't, we do catch microbus voles, but we don't catch them as often. We very rarely catch sagebrush voles, but I had the opportunity in my graduate work to actually do a lot of small mammal trapping early in the year. I was really excited and wanted to get out and do that probably a little earlier than I should. And we had very good success with catching bulls before green up. So before there were alternative food resources on the landscape. So, you know, that in my mind emphasizes the point that they're probably looking for food. Um, and, you know, certainly cambium is, is a food resource utilized by a lot of species, so. Excellent. Bernie has a recommendation of the um, Tamara Hartson squirrels of the West and John Struble's Small Mammals of the Yellowstone Ecosystem as good books for that. And then um, Anna has a question that says, I joined a bit late, so please ignore if the question was addressed. But can you speak to some of the specific ways that these small mammals are important in the GYE, which is a great question. Of course, yeah. I mean, like most things in the world, it comes down to food. Um, you know, tree squirrels, um, in addition to other small mammals, are very um, apt at dispersing um, fungal spores. So, you know, you have various species of truffle or truffle-like fungus that almost require small mammals to dig them up and move them around, cache them in other places. But you also have, um, I don't know if anybody's ever wandered you know, around late in the summer and seen a bunch of mushrooms in a tree, like somebody picked them there and was letting them dry, red squirrels will do that. So when they're moving those mushrooms around, they're also depositing spores further around. You know, they move seeds similar for plants. Um, you know, they can cache those um, in various places. Um, 
I'm trying to think. I know, I'm not sure which plants, but I'd assume that some seeds go through um, and come out the other end and, you know, are viable that way. So yeah, they can move, um, help move plants, move fungi. They also provide food for say gray gray owls, um, other raptors, um, various herbs, you know, snakes in particular. Um, so yeah, there's, yeah, there's enough of them that they have very meaningful impacts um, on bigger animals as well as a lot of other species. Thank you. Um, Bernie does have a photo of a bull that he might want you to look at. So I, are you I can see that and it's very small, but I'll try to zoom in. Um, yeah, I was having a hard time when so I zoomed. To me, I think if that if that is a bull, um, which I think it, it looks kind of consistent, it's chunky like one. Um, kind of my thought process is first looking at the tail, which um, if it's that black line kind of sticking out there from the back of the animal, it looks like it's under, you know, about maybe half the body length, maybe a little less. Um, so that in my mind would probably point more toward like a, uh, a meadow bowl or a montane bowl. Um, again, I, I, you know, some people will say that there's really subtle variation in the um, coloration. I, I've kind of seen that, but I just haven't seen it consistent enough to, to want to make a call like that. So yeah, I'd, I'd lean toward my Crotus Vole, um, but I'm, I'm not sure I'd really go much further than that. So, Thanks, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> sorry to not, not give you a satisfying answer. Oh no, that's fine. <laughs> okay, I mean, I can, <laughs> if you want, it just probably won't be right. Um, <laughs> Awesome. And then Benjamin says, have moles been mentioned? And I think you did say that moles are not present in this area. So then they go on to say, are the raised soil runways actually made by pocket gophers? Yes, they are. Do mm -hmm. pocket gophers den far below the surface? Are they very rarely seen on the surface? So yes, they do den. Um, I don't know how deep. I suspect it's probably not like 10 feet, but probably a foot or two, maybe a little more. Um, they do come up above the surface, um, as those tailing piles would suggest. They are out um, and about foraging. We do catch them in traps, you know, set, but they also can forage underground. So I think they spend a lot of time under underground. Um, they have really poor eyesight. Um, at least when I've had them in hand, they kind of, they're kind of dopey. They just sit there and look really sweet. And then you go to pick them up and they kind of launch toward you and it's pretty big teeth. <laughs> so, um, wow. Um, Samantha says, can you speak a little bit about torpor and which of the small mammals experience it and are any of these true hibernators? Oh man, this is getting back to um, <laughs> some university mammalogy class. I'm struggling to remember the, you know, strict definition of hibernator versus um, kind of animals that go into torpor. Um, I think, you know, one of the classic examples of hibernation are, um, are um, jumping mice. They um, sleep a, a really, you know, good chunk of the year. Um, actually, same thing with marmots and our ground squirrel species. You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I think with, uh, with like marmots and jumping mice, they actually go down kind of earlier than you'd expect, you know, kind of early fall, late summer. And that has to do with the fact that they put on enough weight that they can survive the winter. So it's better to be underground um, and safe than it is to be up foraging. We also coincidentally see that with bats too, where um, male bats will kind of hang out in caves well into June because there's really no reason for them to be up and active. The females have to get out, have to grow their pup, you know, so they're, you know, I don't know, more active for longer during the year. And they also don't live as long. Our male bats, you know, some of our myota species live to almost 40 years, at least. We still find bands from a project that was in the 80s or done in the 80s in one cave. Um, so yeah, I think with the hibernation, you know, it's, it's this kind of balance of food resources and almost mitigation of predation risk. Um, so yeah, some of our, our squirrel species are definitely true hibernators, same with the, with the jumping mice. Um, other species um, like deer mice, I think will use torpor, um, you know, just kind of 
turn off and rest. Um, I think shrews do as well, but I'm not, I'd assume that they do. Um, okay, um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the question about the ground squirrel names. We did have a recording, so you can go back and look at that. Um, the difference between a mole and a vole, could you briefly? <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Um, so moles are, uh, we wouldn't have those here and moles are in the Talpidae or they might have, the taxonomic designation of those has been kind of up in the air, but they're probably more closely related to um, our shrew species than they are to our rodents, which voles are. So you would expect to see moles have um, be very adapted for life underground. They have these big claws, they have very tiny ears, they have that really soft fur um, that you can rub both ways. So they can move backwards and forwards in their tunnels. Whereas voles, you know, do burrow. You know, they have um, nests, sometimes underground, sometimes above ground, but they're much more, um, you know, they're more terrestrial. And so, yeah, a little bit different adaptation. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, Bev has a good question. Do some predators specialize in certain small mammals or do they tend to be generalists um, or depending on the habitat shared by the prey and predator? Um, I think it's probably a mixed bag. I know um, great gray owls, I think, are bull specialists. Um, I might be wrong on that. I'm not a I'm not a bird person, but I've I've heard that. Um, we did just hear a, a PhD defense on Monday where she spoke about great gray owls in other parts of their ranges being bull specialists, but here in the Jackson, in her study area, they're actually um, more specialized on pocket gophers, which was really interesting. No to me. kidding, huh? Yeah. Man, that's that's fascinating. Um, yeah. So I mean, yeah, I don't. I'm not that familiar, but I kind of think at least with like, say, weasels, they probably eat anything they can find. Um, so, yeah, I, I think of, yeah, I think of most animals as just being kind of specialized in maybe a type of, of prey. But, you know, if anything kind of meets that definition, you know, they'll probably go after it. So it's not a very satisfying answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, Francis has one more question about uh, the effects of recreation on rodents. So it says, given that at least some of these species live in the subnimian, are there any studies on the effects of mount high mountain skiing, like backcountry skiing on their movements and populations? You know, there's not. Um, that's a good question, at least to my knowledge. Um, and I'd, I'd lump snowmobiling in there too. I think I kind of wonder about that just because snowmobiles do tend to um, at least based on my very antiquated backcountry ski um, knowledge. It, I remember hearing that they went a little bit deeper, so we're more likely to trigger, av trigger avalanches. But, you know, certainly anything that's compacting that space would be, um, would have impacts on the animals trying to use that. I think, you know, having sufficient snowpack within an area and having that well-developed layer right along ground level where these guys can burrow and you know look for prey it's incredibly important for the species that are awake during the, the winter wow thank you that's a great answer and someone says benjamin are pikas rodents i got this one pikas are not rodents they're lagomorphs is that correct they are <laughs> they're more closely related to rabbits um awesome Cool. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. So if that's everything, um, thank you so much for this very enlightening uh, discussion tonight, Dan. This was amazing. So thank you so much for being here. And thanks to everybody for joining tonight. Yeah, yeah and happy to answer questions. So I think my email is in there. And yeah, I'd be happy to chat small mammals with anybody and everybody. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'm going to end the call here. Everyone is saying great job and thanks, Dan. So All right. thank you so thanks, much. Guys. Have a good evening. You too.